Hello, this is Anlin G. Davison, and this is my fiance, Brandy McKenzie. Say Hello. hi. I don't know if they heard you or not. Mm. She has a very soft voice, and I'm... Okay, we might have to just pass this microphone back and forth, because apparently even I having a bit of a time carrying according to our little system there. So I apologize if this is too loud, too soft. Just have fun with the little volume switch, shall we? And, um, oh, what's one more character, Mr. Dalek. Exterminate. I'm not really very good at uh, impersonations. And uh, we've decided that we are going to do a review of the newest episode of Doctor Who, Matt Smith's run, which is, by the way, a very good doctor, um, the journey to the center of the TARDIS, on request from Brandy here. Uh, so, are we going to be defending or attacking today? I think I'll defend for today. You're going to defend? Yep, okay. you get to attack. Oh, boy, I'm going to have fun with this one. All righty. Uh, first major problem with this episode is that nothing really seemed to matter at all with this episode whatsoever. Everything basically gets erased at the end of the day. All the nice little uh, conversations, the character development, um, even the nice little resolution at the very end between the three brothers that was, yeah, kind of stupid sucked and entirely pointless just there to pull at your tongue your little heartstrings at the end of the story um yeah overall it was just like haha all of this character development bye it, well it might come back to play i mean we are current so in the next few episodes we might see the character development again it might come back into play I don't, that's just my thought it's this is steven moffat we're talking about yeah, my faith in him's kind of been shaken up as of lately. <laughs> Though, by the way, I am actually a big fan of some of his better works, such as Blink and... Is this thing even working? Testing. Testing. Wow, I really do have to get close to this thing. Anyway, I do like Blink. Uh, some of his other actual episodes that he uh, ba that he wrote, he did exceptionally well with. I just don't really like the this one in particular. Though, to be honest, I don't think Stephen Moffat actually wrote this one. I'm not sure. No, I remember it now. He wasn't actually the writer, but uh, I believe Stephen Moffat has to okay these things before they get passed through. He's the one we blame. He's showrunner. <laughs> yes, we are going to blame you, Moffat. Anyway, uh. Let's see here. What else I uh, did not much care for? Uh, the uh, TARDIS exploding. Again, that... Still no actual reasonable explanation of the whole TARDIS exploding. I'd like to think that the two are connected in some way, shape, or form back from, I think it was season five with Matt Smith, that the TARDIS exploded and he was like, a uh, question for another day. I'm wondering if maybe this is connected between the two, but to be honest, it's never actually said, stated, or explained, or even hinted at in the entire episode. No, it's never. It, it was kind of a uh, surprise at the end when the TARDIS exploded with the crack again. Yeah, uh, luckily for Matt Smith's character, the one real complaint that I actually had outside of that was the fact that he's like, the TARDIS doesn't have an explode button. Well, we all know that d it the does. Big friendly button? Well, was the big friendly button was kind of... An, oh, the oh, self-destruct button. Yeah, he actually told them that, it, that he didn't have a self-destruct button, but rule number one, the Doctor lies, so he can actually get away with contradicting himself in some way, shape, or form. The Doctor lies, of course. Anyway, um, some of the things I did actually like were quite a few of the callbacks. The uh, cradle was a nice touch when she was actually wandering around the TARDIS. In the attic place, that was a good callback. The TARDIS, the little TARDIS, I think that's the one that Amy made, wasn't it? Not sure. I think it might have been, or it could have been a toy from his childhood. I, I can't really remember the Demon's Run episodes very well, to be honest. No, I think the, the little toy TARDIS was more from Amy because... Tardises have the chameleon circuit. You know what? That's actually true. I've got to give you props for that one. Uh, and since I'm a bit of a fan of the old two, haven't watched all of it working on it, I did actually notice the umbrella, which I kind of sort of smiled a little bit at. And I think there was like one other item on my notes, but uh, sadly they're over the there. Bed. Yeah. Oh, the Eye of Harmony. Yes. The Eye of Harmony was another nice little comeback as well. And uh, to be blatantly honest, I'm kind of just sort of doing all of this out... <laughs> Anything you actually particularly liked? I really loved Clara's acting in this one. I got the feeling that she was really, truly frustrated and scared when the TARDIS was pulling all of these tricks. Like the hallway bringing her back to the Echo console, console room. 
I have to admit, I did kind of wonder about what the heck the TARDIS was up to, considering that monsters seem to appear when she has complete control of the actual situation itself. Though, in Sam wrote as her, the TARDIS itself was very excellent. Its acting ability is TARDIS, amazing. I think the TARDIS had the best acting ability in this episode. <laughs> How sad is that? I'm going to have to argue that one and say Matt Smith's acting was above and beyond, as usual, for Matt Smith. TARDIS can't beat the TARDIS. Please, it's all about the doctor. <laughs> Who takes him where the doctor needs to be? Okay, now we're just now we're just <laughs> stre- flexing our fan muscles here. I don't really think a lot of people came here to see us go back and forth. Um, another thing is the library. I really liked the library. The Gallifreyan encyclopedia was also a nice touch, but I think things were a little out of order because I'm pretty sure that the doctor doesn't write in English. He writes in Gallifreyan. The library. Don't even get me started on the library. We'd be here all day with her gushing about that. Trust me. Actually, I think it could have been bigger. I mean, it's on the TARDIS. It could have been a lot bigger, but... Oh. Yeah, it probably could have been bigger. It is bigger on the inside. Anyway, uh, outside of that, uh, another major issue I had, the monsters. Oh, God, I don't understand that. It's, you burn up and you don't get to go running around killing people, and their personalities completely changed when they burnt up. It's it made no sense. I don't really recall a doctor outside of the 13th doctor that uh, Colin, uh, I think Colin Baker actually ran into in the old who that was actually going out of his way to kill anyone or anything in that matter. Um Let's see here. What other problem? The mo- the monsters were a big gripe. I-, I mean, as I was watching this episode, I was having so many little explanations as to why this was going on and why this was happening. And no, it's the f- it's the future leaking in. And I'm kind of like, that just doesn't seem right to me. It really doesn't. Every single time I, l- I, l- I watch that or look at that or even think about it, it's kind of like you couldn't have come with a better one-off explanation like- than that. Like, maybe it was a some creature that was so dangerous that it, oh, the TARDIS is the only thing that could contain it. That would have worked. Like, maybe when the TARDIS got hit with the the grabby thingy at the beginning, that the it broke out of its cage or whatever. That would have made a lot more sense. I've actually got a couple of different little fan theories, but I'll save those for uh, later on. Um, I really disliked the almost the entire instigation of the actual episode itself. It couldn't have been Clara accidentally t- driving the TARDIS too hard or something along those lines that would have been a little bit more reasonable than some gravity beacon and a little bomb going off at the exact right moment in time. Complete and utter pointless pander. I mean, it made absolutely no sense. If I remember correctly, it was <clears throat> even the hordes of Attila the Hun could not get into this TARDIS. Believe me, they've tried. Ah, uh, yeah, apparently three uh, scavengers with a bomb and a gravity, you know, tractor beam. Oh, well, more than capable of doing it. It's a piece of freaking cake for them. Even though cutting the damn door open is a freaking impossibility. Yeah, apparently they rank somewhere between the hordes of Attila the Hun and the Dalek Empire. Only that was two. actually pretty good. I didn't actually, I didn't actually think of that one to be honest. Considering, yeah, there we go. David Tennant <laughs> reference, people. We're really trying to impress you today. <laughs> Wait, I had the Christopher Eccleston one. It wasn't Crystal for no, Eccleston. No, that was a, that was both Eccleston. What was really? It? No, no. no Tenet. Da- David Tennant was the Dalek one because that was when everybody came back with Jack, Har- Jack and both. Rose. Bad Wolf? Hmm, no, I don't think he ever... I don't think Eccleston ever came into a problem during his run where something could get into the TARDIS we're, without We're getting issue. off track. <laughs> okay. Um, could you hand me my notes? I have notes. I am professional today. <laughs> the timing for that couldn't have been perfect. Okay. Um, da- okay. Uh, cl- oh, um, Matt Smith's acting. Let's go back to Matt Smith. Um, 
I really loved his acting in this one. There was a couple of times when he was talking to the TARDIS, which we all know the TARDIS is a sentient being. David Tennant got oh, to the meet her. Oh, the beginning of that one? Yes. I love he the was beginning. talking to the TARDIS. He's Clark counseling. Clark insulting. He's patting the console. It's okay. She didn't mean it. And then, of course, I, I think there was this one part. I can't remember the exact line, but he eventually just shuts up and stuff. But he's just giving her this look like he wants to carry on the conversation. Like, he just wants to keep saying. And, the co- and his uh, expressions alone bring so much delivery to the character and it's kind of like i don't really see matt smith just going off of doctor who and not doing anything with his acting because right. he's just proven himself too good of an actor you know not uh, not in christopher eccleston's range i honestly believe christopher eccleston has so far been the best actor to portray the doctor so far of what i've seen though to be honest david Tennant and matt smith do have their moments of being excellent actors I'm just kind of... I think it's when the writers call for it. It's when we really get to see what each actor really brings to Doctor. Fair point. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I did love a lot of their conversations and bantering and stuff like that. She's She kind of reminds me of River Song, but not nearly as violent and um, no all-knowing. Yes, uh, River Song seems to be all-knowing. Oh, man. I, I still can't get over that part where she looked at uh, Rory and sort of just pulled her gun behind her and shot the silence. And, you know, I thought you weren't supposed to actually know what they were. I, that thing could have been a lot bigger, a lot smaller. She just sort of shot it because it scared her father. Well, uh, love the dedication you got there to your father and everything, but I'm afraid that kind of doesn't make as much sense as I would have liked it to. But, to be honest, still a good scene. We're getting uh, off track again. We've been doing that a lot, haven't we? Well, that's just what happens when you put this woman in front of a camera. Um, days it takes to... I love the explanation for the TARDIS itself. Like, getting around, finding Clara. Uh, I did love that. Where I it's like, it could take days in order to do this. I love that first explanation what he made to the brothers. It was, picture the biggest ship you've ever seen. Now forget it. This ship is bigger and more infinite. I love that explanation of the TARDIS. Um, oh, oh, also the uh, pool. I loved the pool. Oh, she yeah. ran past the pool. That was nice. I loved that. Oh, that. and I like the little touch they had right around that with the um, the, the big astronomy tower, the stargazing thing, I think it was. I know it's a reference to something, but I'm just pulling um, a blank. I, are we thinking, is it inside another Doctor Who episode? Because I think it might have been a reference to the the werewolf episode with Queen Victoria. It did, it did kind it did of look, look like, like that. that. I don't really know if it's an actual reference. Like I said, I'm still trying to trudge through the rest of Old Two, but I don't really know where they'd be able to have afford having something like that on set. <laughs> no, uh, no offense, Old Who. <laughs> we know you had a very, very low budget. We would have loved to have seen what had happened if you actually could have afforded to give us a little bit more. Alrighty, let's see here. Um, I love the fact that the entire uh, episode basically took place on the TARDIS itself. That was cool. It, it, I love that Stephen Moff is really starting to explore the TARDIS, because we've never really gotten to see in front of him. We've heard, heard explanations in Russell T. Davies' time as showrunner, but we've never really seen into it. Um, Part of me is kind of hoping we never really get a full explanation unless no, <laughs> unless Paul McGann actually does in fact come back and reprise his role as the Eighth Doctor. I don't want a freaking explanation unless it's from the horse's mouth, the man who lived through it. And by the way, the nineteen ninety the nineteen ninety six uh, movie grossly underrated. I thoroughly enjoyed it, despite the, uh, even after I watched the entire series of Eccleston, all of David Tennant, and all up to Matt Smith. I did actually go back and watch it again, and I was like. You know, this is actually really good. I don't see why people have a problem with it. But then again, I was kind of raised in the 90s, so maybe I kind of, like, see that stuff and I'm like, nostalgia. <laughs> um, I did think there was a couple of scenes that were a little out of order with the... Uh, the, uh, the Gallifrey uh, uh, the, the Gallifrey Encyclopedia. I loved the fact I, that they... Mm. I, I like the fluid thing. Oh, no, I love the Gallifrey Encyclopedia. Um, the fact that it was like when you could hear it instead of reading it. But what I didn't like much care for in the library was the the history of the Time War. You think it would be written in Gallifreyan because it's the Doctor and he's a Time Lord, but how can Clara read it? Rivers clearly said in another episode that Gallifreyan doesn't translate. That and the fact that she just sort of opens up a page. Oh, that's his name. <sighs> never seen a previous incarnation so how should we how would she know that yes this is the doctor that i'm looking at i don't even know there's any pictures in the bloody book yeah we don't know that either 
I mean, what is the very like halfway through the book, we all of a sudden get a picture of every single Time Lord that was involved in the actual Time War, and we get a nice little big thing with their title, and then right underneath that, their actual name. Yeah. I did like a couple of the fan speculations to why he's hiding his name so greatly and stuff like that, but to be honest, they're just speculations, and that's another problem. I don't want to know the Doctor's name. Nope. No, I think it would take away the mystery of the Doctor if we knew his name, but I'm kind of iffy on it. It's, it'd be interesting to know it, but I really kind of don't want to know it. Yeah, I think it really wouldn't make too much of a difference, and I kind of rather them dangle the carrot in front of my face instead of letting me have it, because at the end of the day, the carrot just kind of tastes like a carrot, and it's not really all that tasty. <laughs> well, I hope I'm doing something good, because apparently you're laughing at my jokes, but considering you're my fiancé, I guess you're kind of entitled to it, or required to. Is that a requirement in the marriage contract? You'll have to, I'll have to do some looking up and research on that You'll one. You'll have to let us know. Uh... We're not that lazy. We can research our own stuff. Seriously. We actually watched the friggin' episode before we did this review again. Mm. Now, like I said, other than that, though, the TARDIS itself, it seemed a little skewed. Um, I did like how she redirected some of them, like uh, to oh. Matt Smith's little explanations, and how the TARDIS, uh, you know, living, breathing, the Eye of Harmony was pretty cool and stuff like that. I have to admit, I'm kind of curious as to why the monsters kept running into Clara. I think the TARDIS has it out for her. <laughs> like, she's we just... We saw that in the last episode with Hyde. It's Clara, the TARDIS just doesn't like Clara. Which makes me... A, a little explanations and stuff like that online are actually read up. I'm kind of curious as to actually true or not. I'm keeping my fingers crossed. Oh, jeez. So we even go over the uh, brothers? Oh, brother, the brothers... <sighs> The only one I liked was the guy who was the surprise surprise. Yeah, the, the android. The only interesting one. He was the only one that seemed human. Ironically yeah. enough. And of course the fact that all of the little explanations, what happens to him, it all gets erased right at the end. Oh, yeah, so they don't learn a lesson at the end of the day. I have a little scrap. I guess I have a little scrap of decency. Well, apparently not. Cause Big friendly button. No more scrappy decency. Yeah, that's kind of gone. And... The monsters are a big point of why I don't really like this. I could tell you a million different explanations as to why the monsters would be better if you just had a better explanation. Okay, explanation number one. Previous um, um, companions that have died, that have been killed, or in some way, shape, or form malformed, and he, you know, the Doctor being the crazy bastard that he is, actually kept the bodies on site of the TARDIS. No, or no. maybe the re uh, regeneration uh, energy, the residual regeneration energy from each and every single one of the Doctors regenerating inside of the TARDIS itself. That's always sort of been a thing about Doctor Who. The Doctor regenerates inside the TARDIS. You know, I I'm pretty sure, I don't know if that's sure of every single one, but the ones that I have seen, he dies in the TARDIS, or in some way, shape, or form, is near it. TARDIS to be safe because, I mean, shit, you saw what ten, what the regeneration energy did to the TARDIS when he went from ten to eleven. And of course, when nine became ten, the regeneration took place inside of the TARDIS. So maybe we're seeing ghosts of previous Doctors. Maybe that's what happens to, uh, uh, you know, Tom Baker or uh, Will uh, William Hartnell or uh, you know, um, Paul, Paul McGann and and e e Christopher Eccleston. Maybe that. Maybe that's what happened. The Doctors are literally going to run around the TARDIS for all eternity, even in death. That would have been pretty cool. Or maybe previous incarnations of Clara. Like, he's just so confused about Clara, and he brings the bodies onto the TARDIS in order to investigate, and then all of a sudden the TARDIS explosion or something like that brings them back to life. That was actually something that crossed my mind. When they were in the room with the Eye of Harmony, and the one body that was supposed to the monster that was supposed to be clara was beaten at the door he looked at the real clara and said you died i literally thought that that was one of the claras that had died one of the, either the governess or the dalek clara i thought that was one of them <laughs> what a twist <laughs> I honestly think that explanation would have been a lot better as well, considering that would make sense. The Doctor's trying to figure out who Clara is, and who better than try to figure out what the body was. This is this is true. It, those monsters and the brothers are just really messed up. It really wasn't worth it. They weren't written very well, they weren't explained very well, and to be blatantly honest, they were kind of the weakest part of the whole chapter. We could have had the whole episode with just Lo Clara getting lost in the TARDIS, and it would have been at least a little bit more interesting, would have made a little bit more sense. This is true. I'm... 
The TARDIS is, after all, infinite. That would have been a great episode. An entire episode dedicated to the TARDIS, running around inside of the TARDIS, never having to actually leave the TARDIS, and nothing but character development for everyone. Speaking of leaving the TARDIS, with the beginning, how did the Doctor get out of the TARDIS? How did he end up landed underneath the TARDIS in, in the salvage ship? Where did all that extra junk come from, too? How the heck did you get underneath all that? And by the way, it's rude to whisper, so I'm going to talk very loud. <laughs> <laughs> yes, whispering is bad. Don't do it. And Clara, how did she get, like tumble down like three million hallways or something? Is the is this the TARDIS trying to protect her from the fumes? That seems like a possibility in my book. The fumes. The, okay, the do- uh, doctor and the brothers had to go into the console room with those respirators. But how come Clara was completely fine? She wasn't coughing or having trouble breathing or nothing when she was on the TARDIS. TARDIS is protecting her. Maybe a ha- love hate relationship we've got going on here. Hmm? Hey, Doctor, could you turn around? Clara and the TARDIS are going to start making out for us pretty soon. <laughs> what was that you were saying about leaving them alone? <laughs> Crazy things. I'm such a bad influence on you. <laughs> <laughs> Overall, I think it was an okay episode, and I was really hoping from a title with Journey to the Center of the TARDIS. I mean... We could have had callbacks. We could have asked David Tennant to basically come on screen, walk across the schedule, and you could have actually seen crate callbacks. With those, those ghost circles from the past or whatever, from that time rip. Yeah, you could have had anyone, uh, stock footage, paid them a little bit of money just to come back and, you know, walk across the stage. We could have had Martha Jones, Rose Tyler, the great Dr. Donna, Eccleston, oh, yeah. David Tennant. I mean, the guy's already coming back for the 50th anniversary. You give him a couple extra hundred bucks and say, walk across the screen. We would like to actually emphasize a point of this being in the past, but with it just being Matt Smith and, you know, and Clara, it didn't really feel like it was all that emphasized or important. You were saying earlier when we were watching the episode that that would have been a great scene to have a stock footage of Rose and have Clara ask, who is that? And just see so much more emotion and so much character into the doctor. Not that he doesn't have enough character as it is. Trust me, the guy is <laughs> no practically choking more. on it. <laughs> Uh, well, as you can say, I do actually love Matt Smith's portrayal of the Doctor. I just think he could use some better writers. Maybe maybe not better writers. They come up with some really great ideas. Maybe better execution on the writer's part. Or maybe the director or maybe Stephen Moffat needs to start reining some people in and realize he needs to stop playing fanfic with the, Dost- <laughs> the, the, the Doctor Who series. Leave that to the fanfiction writers. Hey, Moffat, if you want to play fanfic, go play with Sherlock. <laughs> Also, very good show. I really enjoy it, did enjoy it. Though me and Brandy have our own arguments over how the ending to that actually worked. Still or didn't work. Still season three. Yes. And now that we have completely and totally gone off subject for the fifth and final time, I'm Alan G. Davison. I'm Brandy McKenzie. Real name's Mitchell Sanders, by the way, in case you want to actually find me on Facebook. I'm probably not going to friend you if I don't know you, so you can try. <laughs> good luck. Anyway, that was it for the doctor, and we didn't really... You know, I need to work on some editing software. This dialogue needs to start talking during these reviews. Anyway, glad you all watched, waited, hated it, loved it. Doesn't really matter. We're planning on coming back, and I, at the very least, intend to do at least the first episode of uh, Christopher Eccleston, my personal favorite doctor so I'll far. i to help with that, because Eccleston's pretty good, in my opinion. Even though her favorite's David Tennant. I'm really worried about him. I'm going to have to hunt the pastor down. He's stealing my fiance. <laughs> Even though he's married. To the doctor. To the doctor's daughter. Which is weird, considering she also played a clone of the doctor. The doctor's daughter played the doctor's daughter and married the doctor. That's almost as bad as the one where he went to a picnic to get killed by his, uh, shot by his wife. Oh, the Lake Silencio? Yes. And with your wife, tries to kill your wife. Yeah, with your best know. friend, who is pregnant. With your wife. <laughs> wow. Yeah, that's a bit of a mouthful right there. Now that we've dragged this on far too long, being fans dorky as humanly possible, signing out.